Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second day of press conferences at the EGU 2017 General Assembly. And uh, I will just remind you quickly that we will have the four presentations by, by our four speakers today, and then we'll open the floor for questions from those here in the room and those watching remotely. Uh, if anyone watching remotely would like to access press releases and other documents related to this press conference, they can do so at media.egu.eu slash documents. Uh, this press conference is going to be on water hazards, how floods and storms impact us and how we impact water resources. And the uh, four speakers are Paolo Ciavola, who is an associated professor at the Department of Physics and Earth Sciences at the University of Ferrara in Italy. And he's also associated with the Consorcio Futura in Ricerca, sorry, sure. for <laughs> uh, in Italy. And then we have Dirk Einlander, who is a researcher at Deltaris at uh, the Inland Water Systems Department in the Netherlands. And Mays Hassan, who is a PhD student at the Department of Geology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the US. And finally, we have James Kirchner, who is a professor at the Department of Environmental System Sciences at ETH Zurich and at the Swiss Federal Research Institute, WSL, both in Switzerland. And I'll now hand over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have the pleasure to open this uh, press conference. I'll be talking about uh, storms and how we can learn uh, uh, from historical records uh, how to deal with them. Um, generally, uh, flooding caused by coastal storms is one of uh, uh, the main hazards we have to face on Earth, especially in the context of climate change. This is data from the United Nations showing the percentage of occurrence of natural disasters by type. And with the uh, blue color, you can see anything related to water and uh, uh, with the meteorological events. Now, if we look at Europe, uh, um, we have experience of large disasters. The Dutch know this very well. In 1953, they had a major disaster. But in recent times, uh, the French learned as well that they're exposed to these type of hazards and uh, they also realized they were not completely ready to deal with them. Uh, in the Netherlands, the 1953 flood had a major impact on society and also completely changed the approach to management uh, uh, to flooding. Uh, there were many losses, a huge impact on the economic activities, and life really changed from the Dutch scenes. But in reality, if we look at the historical records, this was not a new phenomenon. These are a series of historical maps of floods. And if you see the um, 1682 flood, and you compare it with the 1953, you can make out that there are some similarities. So history should teach us uh, how to deal with these processes. Now, there is a lot of debate at the moment about storm intensity changing. Now, if we look at uh, uh, instrumental records, uh, in reality, we don't have really strong signals. This is uh, work done in the MICORE project, a European Union project, that shows uh, that we don't really have evidence of an increase in storminess. We decided within the uh, risk project, uh, another project uh, uh, coordinated by colleagues in Deltares in the Netherlands, to build up a historical storm database to pull together for a number of countries in Europe participating to the project, all the information that was available from experience. This is the database, it's an open access database, and uh, I invite uh, anybody watching to access and browse through it. Now, the source of this type of information can be variable. It is very uh, interesting to work with historians because they will show you that information uh, from ex voto paintings can provide uh, data that can be used in a quantitative way. Uh, of course, if we move through time, uh, we have the, the arrival of pictures. And uh, also, the local press can be very important. This is a, a newspaper from Algarve showing that uh, there was a cyclone already in the 19th century. Now, this is what you find if you access the database. Um, we span from records from 1566 in Sweden to more recent in Bulgaria. Obviously, occupation by humans control access to historical sources. Uh, you can also spot that there is a, a data set from Bangladesh, because within this project, we decided uh, 
to apply this approach even to a non-European country. Now let's take a couple of examples. One of these is Porto Garibaldi, a small locality near Ravenna in Italy. If you look at uh, the historical record, there were a number of uh, floods uh, um, through time with a flood uh, uh, just before the Second World War, which had a huge impact. Now, it happened that the 5th of February 2015, the very same flood happened again, and nobody actually remembered that they were exposed to this type of hazard. Uh, and the similarities from a physical viewpoint are very, very large. Obviously, occupation changed since. La Fosse sur Mer, I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard this place, uh, is in France was it back since with uh, uh, very large uh, losses. If we look at historical records, uh, this site had a long record of flooding. The problem that uh, uh, in the last 30 years, there was a huge development uh, uh, for inhabitants, for houses. If you compare a 1948 and the 2010 image, you can see that the main problem was not the flooding itself, was the occupation, which increases risk, increasing exposure. What can we conclude from this? Um, long historical records can provide information on the real frequency of storms. Let's not forget that when we do a, a statistical estimation, we are very much controlled by the length of the data sets. Instrumental records for waves and surges, at the very best, will have a, a duration of just over 100 years. Now, there is also a problem of uh, uh, communication awareness of the population. As time passes, uh, we tend to forget um, the past and we have a sense of security. In La Fosse sur Mer, people were feeling safe because there was a dike built by Napoleon that since had not been breached, but in reality, their exposure uh, was high to this type of risk. Um, if we uh, use this type of information, we can uh, actually improve uh, uh, future estimations uh, of uh, risk, which, as you all know, are quite important because there is an additional component uh, to this, which is uh, sea level rise. Thank you. There it is. So to the next topic, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to present something about a uh, global picture on flood hazards. Uh, this is work we've done with colleagues from the World Resources Institute and uh, IVM uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm from Deltares and we've worked on this with a group of colleagues who are mentioned here. So it was already mentioned in the previous presentation, um, flood hazard is one of the biggest hazards, uh, natural hazards on the earth. And if we look at coastal flood hazard, um, this is particularly relevant because many people live in coastal places. Uh, it's estimated that about 10% of the global population lives within 10 meter below mean sea level. So. What I'd like to present is a new analysis of global coastal flood hazards. And uh, this is new because we use the first global physical tide and surge model to estimate these hazards and also made some improvements to what is now uh, regularly done in uh, hazard mapping. And this is embedded in uh, a project which is called the Aqueduct Global Flood Analyzer. This flood analyzer um, aims to raise awareness about uh, flood risk. It already was launched two years ago and it contains uh, at the moment a global picture of river flood risk. A uh, user can interact with the data, zoom into a country or river basin and see what the risk is that they are facing. Um, they can also play around with the protection level in that basin to see like, if they would, uh, for example, build levees or dikes how the risk will change. So uh, 
we have river floods now and we would like to extend this to coastal floods and this is where this project comes in so as i mentioned this is the first uh, time uh, the global tidal surge reanalysis data set is using as such uh, for this purpose this is a model which uh, models uh, simulates tides and surge uh, in all the oceans uh, it is a model without any boundary conditions because it's completely spher spherical and has a high resolution for this type of models. Um, this model was forced with uh, 35 years of data to derive uh, levels of actual seawater levels of typical storms, like for example, a one in a 100 year storm. And that's also where uh, what the next results will be based on this one in a 100 year storm. So if we have this storm and we want to see how much uh, land is impacted by the storm, what is typically done on this scale is that this surge level is just propagated onto the land and uh, this is called a planner or bath approach and without taking into account any um, any resistance uh, over land or any dynamical processes uh, on this scale it's still very hard to do this fully dynamical but we uh, have uh, made some improvements another um, point is that the elevation data that's always used here contains a significant error uh, due to vegetation. Uh, this is specifically a problem along coastlines. Uh, elevation data is uh, monitored by sensors from the sky and they sense the top of trees instead of the bare earth. Well, the flooding, of course, propagates over the bare earth, so we have to correct for this uh, error. This picture here shows an example from Bangladesh, um, where on the left hand side you see the uncorrected elevation data, uh, where uh, a national park, the Sundarbans National Park, really stands out as ha having a higher elevation. Well, if we correct for this uh, on the right hand side, you see what we think the bare earth is. And this makes a huge difference uh, in flood estimates because that whole higher area would not be flooded and can even pretend also the land behind that to be flooded. So this is one of the improvements we, we made. And also to account for this uh, dyn more dynamical um, behavior of, of flooding and uh, also that a storm is just uh, a short moment in time, uh, we included a, a factor to correct for that. Uh, the storm was already mentioned before, the Cynthia storm. Uh, here you can see that if we wouldn't correct for that, that's on the left-hand side, we really overestimate the uh, with an order of magnitude the, the impact of a flood. So we use this approach to come up with new uh, data on global coastal flood exposure. Um, in this picture you see the top 15 countries uh, in absolute number of people being exposed to coastal flooding. Those balls on the left side, the grey parts, show the, the current uh, exposure. And you can see that yeah, uh, about half of the, the current uh, people exposed to this risk are living in four countries, that is uh, China, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia and India. Um, and uh, Southeast Asia in particular uh, has, uh, has many people exposed to this risk. If we use projections for future climates, uh, we used uh, RCP 8.5 projections for sea level rise and projected to 2080 and also projections for uh, land subsidence, which both influence coastal risk. Uh, we see a change of uh, more than 50% of 50 more people being exposed to this one in a 100 year flood. And that's uh, again in the same uh, area, but also other countries like the US sees a uh, large increase. I have to mention that in these numbers for 2080, any changes in population are not yet included. And also we assume there is no protection yet. However, we will include this in the new version of the Aqueduct Global Flood Analyzer that I mentioned before. So later this year, besides the river floods, also coastal floods will be included and also socio-economic changes will be included uh, together with protection levels and 
similarly to the river floods, users can interact with the data and uh, become aware of what their flood risk is. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Mace and I'll be talking today about the um, water supply along the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, which is work I've been doing at the University of North Carolina. Um, the Tigris and the Euphrates are two of the um, longest rivers in Western Asia. And as they, go, they travel from Turkey to the very south of Iraq, and as they pass through there, they're passing through one of the most um, water stressed areas on the planet. And in Arabic, the Euphrates is called Furat and means sweet water, and the Tigris is called Dijla. Um, so the main finding so far from our work is that um, ba based on how quickly the water supply stored behind Mosul Dam is changing, some of the biggest changes have occurred during the first Gulf War and not so much during some of the other conflicts and droughts in this that have occurred um, over the, the last 30 years. The way that we um, researched this was by using satellite data. And the American government has placed millions of satellite images for free download and viewing online, and they're available to everyone in the world. And these images, um, they're available to everyone, so we're able to monitor how um, water resources, night lights, wetlands, and farms have changed over the past about 40 years. Um, some of the first satellites that I've been using the data from were launched in the 1970s. So, um, there's many things that you can monitor, and what I've been focused on and what I'll talk about today are water resources. And in particular, I'm looking at Mosul Dam, and Mosul Dam was built in 1985, so pretty much the red arrow there shows the dam site, and um, it's built on the river, and the dam bottles up all the water behind it so that this lake forms. And this lake expands every spring during the snow melt time, during which um, the snow in the Turkish mountains melt and all the water rushes into the lake. And then it contracts during the really dry months of September late and late summer. Um, so because the lake is there, farmers are able to use the water to irrigate their crops year round. And there's also a hydropower station there, so they're able to deliver electricity. Oh, yeah. um, so first, I'll just walk you through a quick visual glance at how this lake has changed over some of the past several years. And this particular time period corresponds with some um, major events, one of which was a major drought that occurred between 2007 and 2009. And um, this is called one of the most, like they think it's the, one of the most severe droughts that occurred here in the last 70 years. And of course, you all probably are aware there's also been um, conflict here starting around 2014. Um, so what we can try to do is see if visually the lake size has changed based and if those changes are corresponding with some of those major events. Um, but another thing we can do is do a more um, rigorous approach where instead of just looking at it visually, we can use something called the Normalized Difference Water Index in order to um, try to really quantify the exact um, lake area for each satellite image that we have. And um, so the way the Normalized Difference Water Index, or NDWI, works is that it um, takes kind of the difference between the green reflectance that's coming off of the surface of the Earth and the near-infrared reflectance. Water will have higher values of NDWI than land, and usually the difference is great enough that we're able to set a threshold, and so we're able to um, separate the water from the land. And you can see here that the, wa that the water has been classified in that white color. Um, let's see, so basically what we did was, we um, used, we, up, we applied that technique to every single cloud-free Landsat satellite image that we had from um, about 1984 onwards. And then we found the average daily rate of change in the lake 
area between every single one of the consecutive land sat images. And finally, we overlaid that graph of the rates with some of the major events that have occurred in this region. And as you can see, some of the, um, like the really, sh the two really sharp downturns in the lake area, in the rate of change in the lake area, those both occurred during the first Gulf War. But you don't see similar really sharp changes during the more recent conflicts or during some of the major droughts that have um, occurred during that time. Um, so. Um, I guess kind of it's now for us to try to determine exactly what it was that happened that caused those really sharp downturns in the lake area. And um, so for future work, we'd also like to come up with a kind of conceptual way of linking um, data on droughts, on irrigation withdrawals, on upstream dams to kind of create a cohesive picture of how all those different factors interrelate in, um, in the water supply here. And I'll close by saying that it's, um, this was kind of an exercise in only using satellite data. So we didn't really have like on the ground, a lot of on the ground information. So it's kind of a way to see what can you um, discover just using the satellite data when you have very limited ground data. Um, and if you want more information, then um, there is, thank you. Uh, If you want more information about this, hang on one second. Uh, I just want that one. Perfect. Okay, so if you want more information, then I have this on my YouTube channel. So you all can um, check it out online. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. Um, so, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm James Kirchner from ETH Zurich in Switzerland. I have the pleasure today to represent a large international uh, author team on a paper that is published today in Nature Geoscience on global aquifers and the age of water in them. Uh, in particular, I'm here today representing the lead author, Scott Jacheco from the University of Calgary in Canada, um, who unfortunately cannot be here today. Groundwater is the largest freshwater resource on Earth, not counting, of course, the large ice sheets in uh, Greenland and uh, Antarctica and so forth. There is 100 times more groundwater beneath our feet than there is in all the lakes and rivers on the planet. This resource supports about 40% of the world's irrigated agriculture. It supplies drinking water and household water to literally billions of people. And therefore, uh, if these resources are vulnerable to depletion or contamination, we really need to know about that. So there are several, there are two main findings from our study. The first is that most of the groundwater under our feet is surprisingly old. In fact, roughly half, potentially more than half, of the water under our feet is so-called fossil groundwater, water that is more than 12,000 years old. In other words, water that dates from the time when mammoths roamed the earth. This is at least twice the volume of all the modern groundwater under our feet, meaning groundwater that fell as rain within the past 60 years or so. Um, and that Deep wells, wells deeper than about 250 meters, are pumping mostly fossil groundwater, except in unusual cases. This is important because fossil groundwater gets to be old precisely because it's not moving very fast and therefore is probably not being replenished very rapidly. So many of these fossil aquifers may be non-renewable on human timescales, so there's a tremendous amount of water down there, but in a lot of these aquifers, once that water is gone, it is gone for good. And as we deplete the shallower, younger groundwaters that are more easily accessed by 
shorter wells, we're going to become increasingly dependent on these deeper, older groundwaters. These fossil groundwaters have been widely exploited uh, because they're assumed to be isolated from modern contamination, like pesticides or um, fertilizers and so forth. Um, but our second major finding is that when we look at the fossil groundwaters on Earth, roughly half of them also contain some fraction of recent uh, groundwater, water that is less than about 50 or 60 years old. So it's a bit like going to a giant old folks home and suddenly realizing that there are also little kids running around. Um, now, that's great, except if the little kids have the flu. <laughs> and so the concern is that this f these large fossil groundwater aquifers may be um, contaminated by recent uh, uh, contaminants from modern society because they also contain a component of recent water. Now, these groundwaters are mixtures of young and old water, either because of mixing within the well itself, because often these wells are open at shallow and deep depths, or because of mixing in the aquifer itself underneath our feet. Now, how did we figure this out? We figured this out by looking at two uh, isotopes in the groundwater itself, um, and more precisely, by compiling a global database of these isotope measurements in approximately 10,000 wells around the world. One isotope we use is carbon-14. Carbon-14 occurs naturally, and it decays with a half-life of a little less than 6,000 years. So water that is significantly depleted in carbon-14 is water that has not seen the atmosphere uh, for many thousands of years. The second isotope we use is tritium. Tritium has a half-life of only about 12 years. Um, so water that has no tritium has fallen as rain prior to about the 1950s or so. Um, and so from looking at the concentrations of carbon-14 and tritium in the well water, we can figure out what fraction of that water is more recent than about the 1950s, what fraction of this water is very old, uh, older than about 12,000 years, and what fraction of this water is of intermediate age. Some important qualifiers. We are not saying that half the fossil groundwaters on Earth are known to be contaminated. We are saying that although these groundwaters are very old, we cannot exclude the possibility that they may contain modern contaminants. The second important qualifier is that, by definition, if you are studying groundwater, you only get data where people have wells. And therefore, um, we cannot obviously uh, directly uh, extend our findings to the many places on Earth where people have not drilled wells because they have not needed to drill wells. Let me close with a few uh, examples here. The High Plains Aquifer in the central United States runs from roughly Nebraska to roughly Oklahoma and Texas, um, and it irrigates a vast uh, area of agriculture there. The High Plains Aquifer is mostly water that fell as rain during the Pleistocene, during the last ice age and before. And once that aquifer is depleted, it will take about 6,000 years to replenish that water. That aquifer has now, the water level in that aquifer has now been depressed more than 100 meters below its level from some decades ago. Um, in Libya, uh, there is a gigantic aquifer underneath Libya, the so-called Nubian um, aquifer sandstone system. Um, and, and this aquifer, is being depleted at a rate of about 6 million cubic meters per day through 1,300 wells drilled to 500 meters depth um, by the so-called Great Man-Made River, um, a project of Muammar Gaddafi, who you may remember. 
Um, in Libya, of course, the rainfall rate currently is only about 30 millimeters per year, um, and almost all of that evaporates. So the reason there, there is water in that aquifer is from uh, a previous climatic era when Libya was actually wet and green. Um, and there's no prospect for replenishing that aquifer anytime soon. Um, and finally, the North China Plain um, is a vast area in the drainage of the Yellow River where um, the groundwater is tens of thousands of years old but is contaminated with nitrate from fertilizers that are being used today. Um, and so we have clear evidence in that particular case of ancient groundwater being contaminated by a component of modern water from the Earth's surface. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the fascinating presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions. Uh, would anyone have any questions? Please say your name and affiliation when asking. Um, hello, I'm Marie Caru. I'm with the Agence France Presse. Um, I have a question, please, for Dirk Islander. Um, I wondered if you could quantify the 50% more, how many people um, that then amounts to. And also, if you, could, if you could try and explain what you mean uh, when you say that they will be exposed. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, so, first, exposed. Um, that means that uh, I showed how we project those tight and search levels uh, onto the land. And we looked at how many people are basically living there. So we call we use exposed because we cannot say that those people uh, maybe they won't uh, have any flood during their life, but they may be exposed to such a flood. Does that make sense? Uh, so <laughs> just making it more complicated. Um, so a one in a one hundred year level. Um, if we assume there is no protection, so no levees will flood their houses, uh, but uh, like it's not said that this flood will occur. So that's uh, within the next 100 years or so. That's why we use the word exposed. Um, so on those numbers, I don't have like the numbers, I don't know them by, uh, by mind now, but they will be published in this Global Flood Analyzer, the website I showed later this year. But I'm sorry, how can, how can you say 50% more if you don't know what the current number is? Do you know? Oh, the current number now. Yeah. yeah, I just, I don't have the numbers oh. uh, now, but I can look them up. Of course, we have the numbers. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, and just if I may, what, what is land subsidence? Uh, so land subsidence is a process that because of also uh, actually groundwater depletion and also because of uh, forces on top of the ground, uh, the land uh, surface basically subsides uh, and mainly groundwater depletion is one of the forces that has uh, caused um, land subsidence in areas like uh, we used to have large land subsidence in Tokyo and Jakarta is currently facing large rates of land subsidence because of these problems. Uh, hi, Jonathan Amos uh, from BBC News. Question for uh, Mice and for James. Mice, the, um, as you probably know, there's, a, there's a quite a bit of concern about the structural integrity of the Mosul Dam, mm -hmm. um, whether it'll be with us for <laughs> very much longer. How important is that body of water to the, to the people who live around it? Do you have some uh, examples of just how much of the area that water um, provides for? Um. So the Mosul Dam, it provides a couple different services. One is flood control, which you kind of touched on. Um, flood control for people living downstream of that area. And then it also provides irrigation water. So um, they've had a couple of different irrigation projects um, going back to the early 90s, I think. Um, and so those irrigation pro projects, they both are in areas where they're planting winter crops and summer crops. So I guess there's um, farmers whose livelihoods depends on that. Um, then there is the hydropower station. So that provides, um, um, it provides for the city of Mosul, their electric um, capacity. As far as um, um, the water supply in general, the 
like the, since the lake is there year round, it makes the water levels much more, like the availability of water much more consistent than it was prior to 1985, pretty much. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah, thanks. And James, we, I mean, we've long talked about, um, you know, deep groundwater has been this kind of credit card that we should only really use in times of severe water stress and, you know, we're spending it kind of willy-nilly. But what you're also saying here is, as well is that there is now a pollution issue that needs to go alongside that that sustainability argument that we've been making for goodness knows how many years. Exactly, exactly. So, so the prevailing assumption had been that as long as that groundwater is old on average, then um, it must be safe from any modern contaminants. And what we've found out now is that that, that is not necessarily true. Uh, Bob Berwin, freelance journalist. Also to the to the groundwater, uh, did, did you identify what sort of contaminants uh, are getting into this older groundwater? And, and a second question, is there a sort of a geographic pattern of, of uh, fossil aquifers versus replenished aquifers that can be identified? Or what are some examples of some large aquifers that are more frequently replenished in, in modern times? So I can't give you uh, specific examples uh, to your second question, but um, uh, on the first point, uh, we find fossil groundwater uh, in all major regions of the world, and we find fossil groundwater with modern water coming out of the well also in all major regions of the world. Um, so this is not a phenomenon that is local to some particular place. Um, now to your first question of what can some of these contaminants be, um, they could be potentially the full suite of uh, contaminants from our modern society. Um, uh, pesticides, um, uh, fertilizers, chlorinated hydrocarbons uh, from industrial sources, and, and so forth. Um, we have not done a, an analysis of specifically what contaminants are in water from which wells, because please understand, right, what we have done in this study is worked from existing measurements taken by other people around the world, and unless they have analyzed for those things, there is no way that we would know. Um, so we have not ourselves done either the isotope analyses or, in this case, uh, chemical analyses on these wells. James, if, if I may ask, why, could you explain why it had been assumed that the fossil water would be unpolluted and unpollutable? Well, the assumption would be that um, if, your, if your groundwater comes from a time when uh, mammoths were roaming the earth, um, that, you know, those mammoths um, did not have chlorinated hydrocarbons, right? And so, so if your water dates from a time, from a pre-industrial era, the assumption would be it can't be uh, carrying industrial era contaminants down underground. Um, and and that's, that is correct if you don't have a fraction of modern water mixed in. Um, and what we have found is that there seems to be, in many areas, a fraction of this modern water mixed in, either because it gets mixed in in the well itself or because it is in the aquifer itself. That is a key question that we don't yet have the answer to. Uh, Bob Berwin again. To the historical uh, storm record, it mentioned early on this idea of a link with natural cycles. And did you find any, any patterns related to variable natural cycles that we know of, the North Atlantic Oscillation or ENZO or anything like that? Well, uh, you understand that one of the limits uh, of um, using historical records is that you look at the impact. So uh, you're very much constrained by the development of impact through history. Um, compared to using, for example, uh, numerical simulations that reproduce a long-term record, 
uh, where you have a continuous uh, set of information. Um, what I can say about these, uh, the cycles for sure are present, have a very important impact uh, on the flooding and also on coastal morphology. There was a recent paper on um, uh, natural geoscience that linked uh, the signal of this large scale circulation from uh, Australia across the Pacific to California, showing that uh, when beaches erode on one side, they erode on the other side as well. Um, on some areas, it is more complicated like the Mediterranean because you have less uh, the direct link with large scale circulation. Uh, but it is quite proof that there is a, a role played by these large scale phenomena. So we should be looking at the record that is larger than the just few years of our experience of a storm, for example. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question, if there is one. If not, we'll finish here. You're welcome to approach our speakers and book one of the interview rooms we have available. And the next press conference is right here in about 15 minutes on polar regions. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you all very much for your talks. Thank you. Thank you.